Good evening. My name is James David Moran, and I'm the Vice President for Programs and Outreach here at the Society, and I want to welcome you to all to our first spring public program. Though it doesn't feel like spring, we would to call it our spring program. And if you're not familiar with our series, please pick up one of these flyers and uh, come back and join us for one or all the other events, which will take place here in Antiquarian Hall and are all free of charge. Tonight's speaker, Ezra Greenspan, is currently in residence as an ASNEH fellow. This fellowship is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and Agency of the United States Government. The Society's relationship with the NEH began in 1972, and since that time, they have generously funded much of our work, including allowing us to catalog our collections, create the New Nation Votes database of early American voting returns, mount exhibitions, conduct lectures and other public programs, and sponsor a summer seminar for school teachers. The NEH has also provided us with four separate challenge grants that spurred other funders to support the Society's work. Since 1975, the NEH funded 19 separate grants for fellowships that allow us to bring three to seven nationally renowned scholars each year to Worcester, where they conduct research in our collections and engage in our shared intellectual community. The NEH is a vitally important component of how we, as Americans, preserve and share our common heritage and culture. Here at the American Antiquarian Society, we are particularly grateful for their enormous and transformative support. Ezra Greenspan is the Edmund J. and Lewis W. Kahn Chair in Humanities and Professor of English at Southern Methodist University. He is a literary and cultural historian who studies the history of print culture in its various manifestations in the United States. Dr. Greenspan is interested in particular in the central activities such as writing, reading, printing, and publishing, and institutions such as libraries, bookstores, and schools of American print culture. Among his many publications are George Palmer Putnam, representative of American Publisher, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, a source book and critical edition, William Wells Brown, a reader, William Wells Brown, an African American life, and Walt Whitman and the American Reader. He is the co-editor of the journal Book History, the annual journal of the Society for the History of Authorship, Reading, and Publishing, otherwise known as Sharp. Professor Greenspan was elected to AAS membership in 2003. He conducted research for his William Wells Brown biography while he was our Mellon Distinguished Scholar in Residence in the academic year 2009-2010. Please join me in welcoming back to our program as Ezra Greenspan. I want to state, as Jim did, my appreciation for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Without any age, I would not be here. And much of the work that I do and people like me would be immensely more difficult in some cases. It would be impossible. So I'm very happy to be here through AAS and NEH together. It's a, a beautiful relationship. A confession. I've loved biography from as early as I can remember reading independently. The genre has shadowed me in the way that our lives shadow all of us. We're all in a biographical mode whenever we observe the path traced by our lives and by the lives of people who matter to us. I make this as a general observation. Here's one I make as a professional biographer. Biography attracts me because it combines an array of elements I find fascinating. Stories, the narrative art of telling stories, people's lives, and the lives of the books containing those story lives. Now, having recently turned 65, which either mean, makes me a senior academic or just someone more susceptible to senior moments, I'll add an additional element. The stories that biographies generate for the biographer over the course of their competition, their composition. Biographies, it turns out, have their own biographies. 
And I'm just going to stop for a second because there are some academics here and they're probably aware that I'm flagrantly confusing and conflating autobiography and biography, but I don't care. <laughs> so that's it. Let me open with a story that I now see underlies my current book project. It comes from a politically tinged conversation I had in the early 1990s with a colleague from the English department at the University of South Carolina. Diane was the personification of a quote-unquote black Carolinian, a term invented by the distinguished historian of South Carolina, Walter Edgar, in his search for a vocabulary that did justice for a state with a history of divided races. At some point in our conversation, Diane expressed a deep-felt grievance. Why, she wondered, do white folks preaching family values, you may remember that toxic term from the 80s and 90s, why do they presume that their idea of family is necessarily our idea of family? That remark got reinforced when she invited my wife and me down to her family's annual reunion at her parents' house in the South Carolina Lowcountry. Dozens of family members and friends came back for that family ritual, some traveling from as far as the West Coast, but most from the, the Carolinas and up and down the I-95 corridor. She called many of them auntie and uncle, but whether they were according to both black and white folks' family definitions might be an open question. I'm here in Worcester this academic year to research a project that tonight, in the spirit of my conversation with Diane, I'll be calling the biography of a black family. The name of the family, Douglas, was and is widely recognizable. Many times when Frederick Douglass, who according to the subtitle of a recent book was the 19th century's most photographed American, entered a room the chant would go up, Douglas, Douglas, Douglas. But African American family names are often semantically and genealogically unstable and discontinuous. Or, as Douglas wrote in his final memoir about the discontinuity of African American family life, quote, the reader must not expect me to say much of my family. Genealogical trees did not flourish among slaves, unquote. Nor did naturally recurring family names. But if names changed, family memory had a persistent power to endure. Douglas's granddaughter, whose name was Harriet Bailey Spray, wrote in a 1927 sketch of her grandfather, quote, he often sorrowfully said that genealogical trees did not exist among slaves." Unquote. Both the quotation, kept alive two generations later within the family as part of its oral tradition, and the name of the speaker, Harriet, whose given name was that of her grandfather's mother, and Bailey, the name of their long-lived family, contradict Douglas's famous comment. Tonight, we're going to take Douglas, the man, the name, the family, as our specific matter of black family history, and we're going to take the dynamic genealogy of the Douglas family tree as our test case for the writing of black family biography. Before we begin, I need to make one clarification, which I do primarily for those of you who frequently attend talks at this library. This talk differs from others this year in one particular respect. Whereas other speakers stand at the completion of a book project, I'm closer to the beginning than to the end of mine. Some, but not most of the remarks I'll make tonight, I'll be making on the basis of preliminary research and even occasionally educated guesswork. Nevertheless, I hope to reach the Huck Finn standard, so that by the time you leave the hall tonight, you'll be able to say to your neighbor, he told the truth. Mainly. <laughs> Douglas's first words in print. Vice. Douglas. 
this is first words in print, they're so well known that many of you will recognize them. Quote, I was born in Tuckahoe, near Hillsboro, and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. Let's locate them in a few other names and places on this map of Talbot County. And what I like, can, can you still hear me? No, no, no. It's fine. <laughs> I must be working off this one. Yeah, yeah. Jim, I can I can manage this with this. The, the idea now is to try to name uh, a number of the people and places that will feature in, in the talk tonight, and perhaps give you a, a way of putting together uh, some of the particulars. So we're looking now at the top right-hand corner. Uh, of Talbot County, and what you can see is the location of, uh, of the Bailey Cabin. This is where, as far as we know, all the Baileys were born, uh, right on Tuckahoe Creek. Uh, right above that, you can see the town of Hillsboro. I'm going to be talking about Hillsboro at the end of the talk. On the end, uh, on the far side of Tuckahoe, is the next county, Caroline County. In the middle of the county is the county seat of Easton. Those of you who know Douglas' story know that that's where Douglas was jailed after his first unsuccessful attempt at escape. Um, it's also, of course, the location of the courthouse, which I'll be talking about at the very end of, of the talk. To come back to the quote that opens Douglas' narrative, I think it's a fair question to ask. Why were Douglas's words, why did they become so famous? Their declaration is prosaic. At first glance, just a sequence of geographical facts linked to the author slash speaker. Furthermore, at the time he wrote these words, Douglas had not lived in Talbot County for over a decade, had fled its prevailing institution of slavery like the plague, was living a life under an assumed name in some place called Lynn, Massachusetts, and had already begun a lifelong pattern of local, regional, and national itinerant speaking that would rival today's jet-setting politicians running for national office. To my biographical eye, however, Douglas's words look definitive. They identify, in fact, they self-identify, the independent-minded young abolitionist who had fled slavery in Talbot County with his past on the Eastern Shore. So, more than 30 years later, he defined himself an Easter Shoreman when he declared to a reporter from the Baltimore Sun, covering his first return in 41 years to Talbot County, quote, I am an Eastern Shoreman with all that name implies. Eastern Shore corn and Eastern Shore pork gave me my muscle, unquote. That's Douglas in 1877. In the months before his death in 1895, he prepared to move in to a vacation home in the first African-American beach resort, Highland Beach, just south of Annapolis, which his son Charles Douglas was organizing. From his eastern-oriented porch, overlooking Chesapeake Bay, this is the, the beachfront right near his house, he would be able to look across time and space to the home of his youth, in effect, spanning the gap between his present northern home in Washington, D.C., and the southern home, past and present, of the Bailey family. The family was named Bailey, not Douglas. It was as Frederick Douglas that he had returned to the Eastern Shore in four well-publicized post-Civil War visits in 1877, 78, 80, and 93. He was by then widely regarded as the most accomplished, influential black man in the United States, and with good reason. He was the federal marshal of the District of Columbia. He had had, or would yet have, close dealings with every president, from Abraham Lincoln to Grover Cleveland. Well, with the exception of Andrew Johnson, you know why. And he was one of the most renowned orators of his generation. All this is Frederick Douglass, not as Fred Bailey, the name under which he had slipped out of slavery to gain his freedom. Yet, 
as Douglas well knew, on the eastern shore, the black name barely meant something. The black name Douglas, whatever it meant, something less. This seems to be the right moment to make a request. I would like to ask you to cross with me over an imaginary bridge spanning Chesapeake Bay between Maryland's western and eastern shores. Um, that Chesapeake Bay Bridge does not yet exist. It's 100 years in the future. The more developed western shore, what most outsiders think of as Maryland proper, containing Baltimore, Annapolis, and such Civil War battlegrounds as Antietam, and the more agrarian eastern shore, containing the largest plantations in Maryland, an agricultural economy in deep stagnation, the strongholds of Southern affiliation, and the famous county of Talbot, which in 1860 cast a total of two votes for Abraham Lincoln. That imaginary bridge connected the two halves of the life of Fred Bailey slash Frederick Douglass. We're going to explore that bridge together in the rest of this talk, but first I want to make clear my operating assumption as a family biographer that the bridge I have in mind as one central to the formulation of African American history is also central to the formulation of our own family histories, whatever our backgrounds may be. Uh, Italian, Irish, Polish, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, um, you can pick your continent, and whatever may be the geographical arcs of the great migrations our families and peoples have made in seeking what Isabel Wilkerson, following Richard Wright, has called the warmth of other sons. I remember from my childhood, <laughs> the popular commercial in the New York media, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's rye bread. Likewise, you don't have to be African American to personalize the dynamic we'll be exploring in this talk. The Bentley's of Talbot County had been present in that center of Maryland colonial settlement ever since a man named Bailey, in the first record spelled B-A-L-Y, whom we'll call the likely family primogenitor, appeared on the soil of the New World. From the date of his birth in 1701 up to the birth in 1818 of Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, he used that name three times in each of his memoirs, and it's the only record we have of the name, the birth name, of this, um, of this particular person. The Baileys had lived in unbroken succession, one generation begetting the next and the next without disruption as slaves in Talbot County. From generation to generation, they passed on not just their family name, Bailey, but also many of their given names such as the four names of his great-grandmother Jenny, his grandparents Betsy and Isaac, his mother Harriet, his uncle Henry, even his middle name, Augustus, was a hand-me-down from his mother's youngest brother, who had died two years before his birth. Fred Bailey was born at an historical turning point as the two mainstays of the Talbot County economy, agriculture and shipbuilding, sank into long-term decline. Eastern Shore agriculture entered a nearly century-long decline following the 1815 Congress of Vienna that ended the Napoleonic Wars, returned soldiers to the fields, and brought cheaper European farm goods to U.S. markets. Simultaneously, the day of the Baltimore Clipper, the heyday of the Baltimore Clipper, whose construction had supplied employment in the docks at St. Michael's in Talbot County and Fells Point in Baltimore, two locations young Fred Valley knew well, passed as, rivers and, as river and ocean navigation turned to larger vessels. The decline of the Eastern Shore economy and the migration of power to Baltimore and the Western Shore destabilized and undercut the Eastern Shore economy and with it, its central institution of slavery. Slaves increasingly bore economic value not as producers, but as merchandise. As agricultural power shifted from the border states to the ample cotton-growing fields of the Deep South, slaves brought their middle border owners 
profit chiefly by sale into the internal slave trade. Local newspapers all across Maryland, but especially on the eastern shore of the 1820s and 30s, were filled both with sheriff sales of estates and with notices of slave traders come north to buy stock for Deep South customers. Um, there are hundreds of these ads. We have a full run of this particular newspaper, the Easton Gazette. Um, it's the fullest run, I believe, in existence. Why it's not in Maryland and why it's in Worcester. We need to talk to Vince Golden about. But typically, these slave sales, these public sales, would take place not just in Maryland, really all across the South, right by the front door of the local courthouse. They were, they were public. Um, and here is a pretty typical runaway slave ad. I'm, I'm deliberately putting these together to give you a sense of cause and effect, and you can play it either way. Slaves ran away, a need for more labor. Um, slave traders come north, well, what do slaves do? They get the message, it's time to move on. And these are, as I say, quite typical of, of what was going on the, during the period. Now to cut directly to our story, what does this have to do with Frederick Douglass? As it turns out, it has everything to do with Frederick Douglass. The Baileys, who had been spared family losses during the stable era, lasting more than a century, from 1701, when the first Bailey is known to be on Maryland shore, <clears throat> lost no fewer than 15 family members during Frederick's youth. In one single day, in July 1832, Douglas lost his sister, Sarah, 18, her infant Henry, his aunt Betty, 31, and Betty's children, Angelina, 7, and the infants, Icy and Lavinia, all sold to one Perry Cohe of Lawrence County, Mississippi. In such deals, all transactions were final, all merchandise was non-refundable, and Douglas would never see any of these relatives again. But what went south, down the river, might also go north, up the Underground Railroad. Fast multiplying numbers of Eastern Shore slaves took flight in the four decades before the Civil War. By the time 20-year-old Fred Bailey fled Baltimore in 1838, the Underground Railroad was up and running. Its most famous conductor would be Harriet Tubman, who came from the Eastern Shore County bordering Talbot on the southeast. But Fred was not the first member of the Baileys to run. More than a decade earlier, his married Aunt Jenny and her husband Noah took flight on Saturday evening, August the 27th, 1825, never as far as is known to return or to be returned. Ten days later, on September the 6th, 1825, their master and Douglas's master, Aaron Anthony, posted this runaway ad in a local Eastern newspaper. And to me, it's an absolutely stunning ad. It's like thousands and thousands of other ads, but there's one particular phrase that um, I think we have to read very seriously in understanding who Aaron Anthony was. And it's that last sentence in the first paragraph. Which, can everybody read it in the back? <laughs> Which is flagrantly untrue. And it's untrue we know because of what I'm about to say. One day after that ad appeared, Anthony counterattacked by selling Jenny and Noah's two children, who were roughly Fred's age, to a firm of Alabama slave traders, as well as two of Douglas's older first cousins. Douglas's only known reaction to this family catastrophe came in his third and final autobiography, quote, the success of Aunt Jenny and Uncle Noah in getting away from slavery was, I think, the first fact that made me seriously think of escape for myself. 
So spoke Douglas in his 60s about his personal break from his days as a slave. He did not at that time address publicly the corresponding question, what was happening to and with the remaining valleys of Talbot County? I will, of course, need in my biography to address at length, it is a central, central question, <coughs> Douglas's relations with the Maryland remnant, whether felt in terms of alienation, loss, noblesse oblige, survivor's guilt, or most likely some combination. For tonight, though, I want to keep the focus primarily where in discussion of Douglas it rarely has been, on the Bailey family and on the Bailey dimension of his life. So what was happening on the other side of our imaginary bridge? How fared it with the Baileys of Talbot County before, during, and after the Civil War? To answer this question as concisely as possible, I want to present brief life sketches of two Baileys of Douglas's age who continued to live south of the Mason-Dixon. His brother, Perry Bailey, and his favorite cousin, Stephen Bailey. And this is perhaps the most crucial document that Douglas scholars have been working with for many, many years. <clears throat> it was compiled at the time of Aaron Anthony, the master's death. They did a the equivalent of a probate today uh, of his property. And what you're looking at on um, that little accounting is an accounting of mostly of the Baileys uh, who were owned by Aaron Anthony. And I want to draw out, um, you can read the, uh, in the 19th century handwriting, simply summarizes what that is. But I want to highlight four particular names. Betty. Betty, you remember, was one of the people who was sold, who would be sold in 1832. whom I'll be talking about in just a moment. Of course, the most interesting of the entries is Frederick, and um, on the, uh, over here, that is presumably the handwriting of the great-granddaughter of Aaron Anthony, four gener generations down the line, who took a distinct interest in Frederick Douglass, by which point Douglass was very famous. In fact, she has copies of most of Douglass's publications. Um, but at the time this document was drawn up, Douglass was just a Bailey. And then finally, his cousin Stephen Bailey. Whole family together on a sheet of paper, a family that would not remain together after this estate sale. So to start with Perry Valley. Perry was five years older than Fred. By the time Fred was old enough to walk on his own, Perry had been moved a 12 mile distance from the birthplace on Aaron Anthony's farm near Tuckahoe Creek on Talbot County's eastern edge to Colonel Edward Lloyd's famous, infamous White House plantation on its western shore. Six years later, Fred walked the same road as his big brother and took up residence with Perry and their sisters at Y House. Much later in life, he would remember Perry as his protector. Douglas wrote a close friend in 1867, quote, Perry has carried me on his shoulders many a time and defended me from the assaults of bigger boys, unquote. The fraternal bond, as you'll hear, was strong and lasting but it was shaped as much by memory as by shared experience. Early on, they were separated for a long stretch of years when Fred, who always seemed to have good luck, was sent off to live with a branch of the Anthony family in Baltimore. Eventually, he escaped. But Perry's life ran along a different track, the main family track of seemingly unending servitude. While Douglas, on the evening of January the 1st, 1863, sang and danced in the aisles of the 12th Street Baptist Church in Boston after hearing Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation, Perry was still living in bondage 
and would continue to an additional 20 months. Not until November the 1st, 1864, after the voters of Maryland passed a new state constitution abolishing slavery, did Perry Valley and the other 87,000 black people unaffected by Lincoln's proclamation gain their freedom. Five black Marylanders who did not were Perry's wife and their children, who had been sold south to Texas by Master John P. Anthony, the grandson of Aaron Anthony. The timing and circumstances of their sale are not currently recoverable. My best guess is that the sale took place in the early 1860s and was executed strictly as a fire sale, Anthony getting something rather than risk losing everything on property of diminishing value. There's no documentation relating to this transaction, but here, to approximate how the transa transaction might look if it left the trace, is the notice from the local Easton newspaper of the last slave sale ever to take place in Talbot County in August 1863. And 1863, August, is a magical date. It's the time at which the Union Army began to recruit not just blacks in Maryland, but <coughs> slaves. And some of those slaves, presumably, were bailies. <clears throat> Um, one other curiosity, because this is AAS, AAS would happen to have the single best copy of this newspaper. Um, someone, I think I know who it is, wrote on it the last, maybe you can read better than I can, the last public sale of slaves in Talbot County. This uh, was written by a man named Samuel Harrison who I know would have voted for Abraham Lincoln in 1864, who would be the future historian of the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, he was keeping track of slave sales. He also was one of the few white people on the Eastern Shore in the 1860s, keeping track of Frederick Douglass. This terrible story of yet another set of ballots sold into Southern Oblivion has a happier ending than the ones I mentioned earlier. Not just happier, but downright amazing. Somehow, 50-year-old Perry Valley, illiterate, untraveled outside Talbot and Caroline counties, and impoverished, managed to transport himself safely across the country to Milliken, Brazos County, South Texas, and there reunited with his family. A jack of all trades previously to master John P. Anthony, he established himself in Texas as a contract laborer. Though now reunited with his, with his immediate family, he eventually sought a way out from the cramped conditions of post-war racially incendiary South Texas. Where to go? What to do? In February 1867, probably got there after the end of the Civil War, probably around Juneteenth, 1865. He reached out by letter to Brother Fred through a literate intermediary to help him come north with his family and be reunited with his long-lost brother in Rochester, New York. Sure enough, three months later, after traveling from Milliken to either Houston or Galveston and on to New Orleans, then north on the Above Ground Railroad, Perry, his wife, and their four children eventually reach Rochester. The reunion of the Valley Brothers was an item in the liberal press. Douglas encouraged it with letters to friends in the weeks following the reunion that quickly got printed. In one, he wrote a friend in New York City, quote, if slavery were not dead, and I did not in some sort wish to forget its terrible hardships, blighting curse and shocking horrors, I would try to write a narrative of my brother Perry's bondage, unquote. Douglas further wrote that their nearly 40 year separation was as complete as if he had lived on another planet. A statement that is amazing in its own right, but that can't be exactly right. Because what happened in Perry's last 10 years, let me just tell you very quickly, 
Douglas built a little house uh, on his grounds for Perry and his family. <clears throat> a year later, he shows up in the Rochester City Directory at the address at which Douglas's son, Charles Douglas, had been living, presumably renting a house. And a year later, shows up back, believe it or not, in Talbot County on the Eastern Shore, remains there until 1877, when Douglas comes down for the first time, that's when he gives that I am an Easter Shoreman spiel. Um, but it wasn't just a spiel. He and Perry reunited. And whether he brought Perry back with him or whether Perry decided to come back, Perry moved with Douglas to Douglas's home in Washington, D.C. And Douglas would bury his brother a year later. So another planet? Maybe, but maybe not. Now for the story of cousin Stephen Bailey, whose name appeared four positions lower than Fred in the inventory of Anthony family slaves we saw earlier. Like Perry Bailey and most other Baileys, cousin Stephen remained in enslavement to Anthony descendants without pause into the first years of the Civil War. But on December the 9th, 1863, 44-year-old Stephen Bailey passed out of John P. Anthony's hands into the ranks of Company C, 19th Regiment, U.S. Color Troops. <coughs> His recruiting officer was the chief Union Army recruiter on the Eastern Shore, General William Burney, the son of James Burney, the 1844 candidate for president on the anti-slavery Liberty Party ticket, and the sometime anti-slavery comrade of Frederick Douglass. General Burney had orders to focus his recruitment on blacks. Lincoln said, I want blacks. But Lincoln made it clear he did not want slaves at that time for political reasons. Lincoln was always very, very cautious. Pushing, but not too hard. But Burney disregarded the orders and recruited slaves or ex-slaves like Stephen Bailey. What bargain, if any, Bernie made with John P. Anthony, I don't know, although I do mean to find out. By whatever arrangement Stephen Bailey came out of slavery, he was quickly assigned to the ambulance corps, so he possibly did not participate in actual fighting. He did, however, serve his full three-year commitment alongside his comrades, most of them, like him, ex-slaves from the Eastern Shore and Southern Maryland. Stephen had likely never traveled far from Tuckahoe Creek in his first 44 years. From 1864 through 67, however, he was present at Harper's Ferry, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, his unit was involved at the Battle of the Crater, Richmond, his unit was one of the first to enter the abandoned Confederate capital at dawn, April the 3rd, 1865, New Orleans, and the Texas-Mexican border. To give you a quick sense of the brave new world he was now living in, I want to talk not about combat, but about his unit's safe passage through the two most vulnerable large cities of the Union, Baltimore and Washington, in spring 1864. On April the 19th, Stephen Bailey and the men of the 19th Regiment, U.S. Colored Troops, slaves less than a half year earlier, marched proudly, guns in hand, and attired in new blue uniforms through the center of Baltimore. They marched before a crowd estimate. I should be very careful about crowd estimates. But <laughs> best guess, and believe me, this is accurate. For a crowd estimated at 30,000 people in a half mile long parade of Maryland units, black and white, past the Washington Monument, past Front Street Theater, where the 1860 Democratic Presidential Convention had met, and the 1864 Republican Convention would soon meet, and past the offices of the leading newspaper, the Baltimore American. The editor of that paper would remark in its next issue, quote, a few years ago, the man who would have said that the Negro would have marched through the streets of Baltimore in military equipment without being assaulted would have been considered a fit candidate for the lunatic asylum. That might be an understatement. Everyone present, perhaps most poignantly Abraham Lincoln, 
understood the significance of the day. It marked the third anniversary of the attack by armed Confederate supporters on the Massachusetts Sixth Regiment as it attempted to pass south through Baltimore to rendezvous with hastily assembled Union forces in Washington. Lincoln's public response that night is opening words, how the world moves. But how did the world move for the black troops that day? Well, for one thing, they marched armed in formation before the chief executive in a city still located in slave territory, as both their relatives and one's fellow slaves watched interspersed among the generally welcoming crowd. As complicated as that scenario must have been, it would have been further complicated by word just reaching the north of the massacre six days earlier of the black garrison in Fort Pillow, Tennessee. The fate of those men they knew would likely be their fate if taken into captivity. A month later, Charles Douglas would write his father from the field in Virginia, quote, take no prisoners, remember Fort Pillow, was his unit's battle cry. That evening, in his public remarks in Baltimore, Lincoln immediately addressed and condemned the Fort Pillow Massacre. And that's what it was called at the time. It's not a, an historical rest, uh, act of, uh, of restoration. Threatening the Confederate leadership with a life for a life. It's something else he said that night, however, that I want to quote. It concerns what his fellow Americans meant when they used the term liberty. Quote, with some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor, while with others, the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. Here are two not only different, but incompatible things called by the same name. Liberty. Lincoln did not need to create racial categories to correspond with his two figurations of liberty. He presumed his audience would supply the missing specifics. Stephen Bailey likely did not hear the president's address that night in Baltimore. His unit had already shipped out to Annapolis from the docks at Fells Point the same docks that Cousin Fred had labored on as a slave in the late 1830s prior to his escape. From Annapolis, Stevens Regiment marched to Washington, D.C. to join the April 23rd Grand Review of the Army of the Potomac that paraded down Pennsylvania Avenue past the East Portico of Willard's Hotel from which President Lincoln and Commanding General Burnside were observing. Lincoln presumably had Stephen Bailey's unquestioning allegiance. Lincoln at that time very likely did not have Frederick Douglass's, who balked at the discriminatory paying conditions that black soldiers received and by what he thought was the not sufficiently aggressive conduct of the war by the president. But he did four months later. At that time, while cousin Stephen Bailey was stationed near Petersburg, son Charles Douglas at Point Lookout, Maryland, and son Louis Douglas at Hilton Head, Douglas and Lincoln met for the third and last time at what was then called the Executive Mansion. Douglas found Lincoln in a state of agitation about the looming presidential contest with General McClellan, which Lincoln expected, lacking a decisive turn on the battlefield. He would lose. One thing both men agreed about was that the outcome would hinge heavily on the success of the continued recruitment of free and enslaved blacks into the armed forces and their contribution to the Union war effort. I'll now pass quickly over the remaining three decades of Stephen's life. After being mustered out in 1867, he farmed his own land near Hillsborough. Just over Tuckahoe Creek, he became the most substantial black, black taxpayer of Caroline County. He served as a local and state delegate of the Republican Party, the party Cousin Fred served at the national level in Washington, and he raised a large, generally successful family. 
Lest I give a misleadingly rosy picture of his life, I need to add that he endured the humiliations, limitations, and dangers of Jim Crow alive and robust on the Eastern Shore, which experienced a rising spate of lynchings during the late 19th century. He also endured a tragedy of a personal nature, an account of which I found in the local newspaper in 1877, a little colored girl daughter, Stephen Bailey, living near this town while carelessly handling, handling a pistol, accidentally shot herself in the head and died almost instantly. In 1890, a present arrived for Stephen and wife Caroline Bailey, a Bible sent to commemorate their 50th anniversary. The giver was Frederick Douglass, who knew that his cousins could not read the text, but presumed that their children and grandchildren would read its contents to them. These are the children of Stephen Bailey at the time of, or rather of Caroline, at the time of her, uh, of her funeral. Um, in the middle, this intrigues me, um, a war hero, <clears throat> George Bailey, who in every document I've seen was marked as illiterate, doesn't mean that he actually was, but likely so, is probably holding the family Bible in his hands. And this, the Bible has survived, I don't know where it is, except that it is still in Bailey family hands, and they have recorded the names and the dates uh, of all of their immediate family members. I don't know how often Frederick Douglass and Stephen Bailey met in the last three decades of their lives. <clears throat> Stephen would die at home on what he had proudly named Bailey Homestead Farm near Hillsborough in 1894, Frederick a year later at home in the mansion house he proudly called Cedar Hill in Washington. But I feel certain they did meet, perhaps for the last time in March 1893, when Frederick came down to Talbot County to visit. His remarks, which got printed in the local Caroline County newspaper, in which Stephen's shopkeeper son George frequently advertised, conveyed the undying significance Douglas attached to the land of his birth. And here is a real piece of the sound of Frederick Douglass's voice, something that I realize has been missing from this talk. Um, but those of you that recognize Douglass, um, when he really is in command of his voice, and this is, a, I think, a completely unknown quote and a real beauty <clears throat> about why he came back to Talbot. I came to drink water from the old-fashioned well that I drank from many years ago, to see the few of the old friends that are left of the many that I once had, to stand on the old soil once more before I am called away by the great master, and to thank him for the many blessings to me during my checkered life of 76 years. That's all I came for. I love the use of the term, the great master. How the world had turned. The ties that bind never did loosen their hold on Douglas's connection to his past, nor did those that bound and bind Talbot County to its past. I'll close by telling you a bit about those ties as represented by the county's historic courthouse in Easton. Even to us here in Yankee they speak to the status of the Douglas family as part of the public history of the United States. Hundreds and hundreds of slaves were sold by the courthouse's front door before the war. After the Civil War, enraged mobs lynched or tried to lynch black people nearby, as well as across the eastern shore as late as the 1930s. In 1916, during the heyday of lynching mania, the city fathers decided to commemorate Talbot's history by erecting a Civil War statue on one side of the courthouse green. Their intention was to honor the memory of what local residents then and now call the Talbot boys, the brave men who fought for the Confederacy. 
The honorary topmost name on the back of the statue is that of Franklin Buchanan, the one-time commander of the U.S. Naval Academy, who became the senior commander of the Confederate Navy. His plantation, named the Reds, stood right next, virtually the next plantation over, to Colonel Lloyd's White House plantation, on whose grounds Buchanan was buried. When Jefferson Davis found himself homeless after the war, Admiral Buchanan brought him home to the Reds. <coughs> and during that 1867 visit, Colonel Edward Lloyd threw a party for Davis at Y House. And I have reason to believe that the current owner of Y House has an autographed photograph, photographed by Jefferson Davis, that dates back to that 1867 visit. So the, the courthouse green stood until 2011, when a second statue was erected, this one commemorating the local boy named Good. It took many years of civic infighting, with the local African-American community on the offensive, the municipal leaders and heritage groups on the defensive, to clear space in the public mind for that breakthrough act. That's the back of the, uh, the pedestal. The Talbot County Civic War, however, did not end then and is not yet over. As recently as May 2016, following the previous year's church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina, the Talbot County branch of the NAACP, backed by the ACLU, petitioned and sued for the removal of the Talbot Boy statue, though to no avail. So, in this precariously balanced standoff, Talbot Boys one side, Frederick Douglass the other, matters stand today in a county still heavily populated with descendants of Stephen Bailey and the men of the 19th U.S. Colored Troops and other black regiments and with the descendants of the white families who once owned them. An epigram <clears throat> to conclude from Emily Dickinson. Today, makes yesterday mean. Today makes yesterday mean. I think the obverse also applies. Yesterday makes today mean. It's at the junction of those two time flows, time moving forward and time moving backward, that the 21st century writing of family biography takes place. This has perhaps always been so, but not in the same way or to the same extent as today. Living as we currently do in a cyber-mediated time of seemingly instantaneous transmission and reception, Ancestry.com and other genealogical sites, social media, nearly universal internet access, and interconnected oral, visual, and audio screens, we occupy a multi-directional, multi-dimensional continuum that endows us with extraordinary capacity to recover the past and to do so in ways conducive to the life stories that we're trying to capture. Given this hyper-mediated capacity, I think we have ample means as writers, as teachers, and as citizens to state emphatically, black lives and black families not only matter, they live on. <laughs>